I, uh, my clients are Hudson River fishermen. And one of the things that I learned from them very early on is that we're not protecting the environment so much for the sake of the fishes and the birds, we're protecting it for our own sake. Because if we want to meet our obligation as a generation, as a civilization, a nation, we need the environment, the rivers, the streams, the mountains. Those are the infrastructures of our community. And if we want to meet our obligation to provide for our children the same opportunities for dignity and enrichment and prosperity and good health as the communities that our parents gave us, we've got to start by protecting our environmental infrastructure, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the wildlife, the fisheries, the public lands, the, the things that can't be reduced to private property ownership, but by their nature of the assets of the entire community the landscapes, the rivers that connect us to our past, to our history, that provide context to our communities, and that are the source, ultimately, of our values and our virtues and our character as a people. Uh, the Hudson River has been a, uh, a, a, an extraordinary ferment of environmental activism ever since 1840. And Washington Irving led a battle to stop the railroads from fencing off the shoreline. And ever since then, we've been blessed with an extraordinarily aggressive and uh, vigilant and sophisticated environmental community that has been willing to go to war to save the river. We have small groups in every community like this one in Rhinebeck, uh, very, very active activist groups and activist communities on both banks of the river at every bend. We're probably the smallest river in the world that has three major multi-million dollar annual revenue environmental groups, Scenic Hudson, Clearwater, and Riverkeeper. And Riverkeeper is the group that, where I, where I got into this racket 30 years ago. Um, and Riverkeeper was started by a blue collar coalition of commercial and recreational fishermen who assembled an American Legion Hall in 1966 to challenge polluters for control of the Hudson River. And we have on the Hudson one of the oldest commercial fisheries in North America. It's 350 years old. Many of the people that I represent come from families that have been fishing the river continuously since Dutch colonial times. It's a traditional gear fishery. They use the same fishing methods that were taught by the Algonquin Indians to the original Dutch settlers of New Amsterdam and then passed down through the generations to sustainable fishery. Uh, one of the enclaves of the commercial fishery on the Hudson is a little village called Crotonville, New York. That's 30 miles north of New York City on the east bank of the river. And the people who lived in Crotonville in 1966 were not your prototypical, affluent, you know, tweed-jacketed, pipe-smoking environmentalists. Uh, they were carpenters and lathers and factory workers and electricians, half the people in Crotonville made their living at that time, or at least some part of it, crabbing or fishing the Hudson. Uh, these were people who had little expectation that they'd ever see Yosemite or Yellowstone or the Everglades, the national parks. They didn't have the resources to take their families on those kind of vacations. Uh, they, for them, the environment was their backyard. It was the bathing beaches, the swimming holes, the fishing holes, the Hudson. That was their property value. It was their recreation. It was their vacations. Richie Garrett, who was the first president of the Riverkeeper, used to say to his, uh, he, he used to say about the Hudson River, it's our Monte Carlo, it's our Riviera. Richie Garrett was a, a grave digger from Austining, New York. And uh, uh, he used to tell his new followers, I'll be the last to let you down. In 1964, <laughs> Penn Central Railroad began vomiting oil from a four and a half foot pipe in the Croton Harmon rail yard. And the oil went up the river on the tides, and it blackened the beaches, and it made the shad taste of diesel, so they couldn't be sold down at the Fulton Fish Market in New York City. And all of the people in Crotonville came together in a room about this size. There are 300 people there in the American Legion Hall. This is a very patriotic community. In fact, Crotonville, New York, had one of the highest mortality rates in World War II of any community in our country. Virtually the entire male population joined the Marines the day after Pearl Harbor. Um, most of the original founders and board members of Riverkeeper were former Marines. They were combat veterans from World War II in Korea, as were many, many of the members. These weren't radicals, they weren't militants, they were people whose patriotism was rooted in the bedrock of our country. But that night they started talking about violence because they saw something that they thought they owned, which was the purity of the Hudson's waters and the abundance of these fisheries that their parents had exploited for generations. 
And those things were being robbed from them by large corporate entities over whom they had no control. And they'd been to the government agencies that are supposed to protect Americans from pollution, to the State Conservation Department, to the Coast Guard, to the, to the Corps of Engineers. In fact, Richie Garrett went to the, and, the, and they, with every one of them, they were given the bums rush. Richie Garrett went to the Corps Colonel with another fisherman named Art Glauca. On over a dozen occasions, they went down to Manhattan and they begged the Corps Colonel to do his duty, which was to shut down the Penn Central Pipe. But finally, he told them in exasperation, these are important people. Speaking of the Penn Central Board of Directors, we can't treat them that way. And by this evening in March of 1966, virtually the entire population of Crotonville had come to the conclusion that government was in cahoots with the polluters. And the only way that they were going to reclaim the river for themselves is if they confronted the polluters directly. And somebody suggested that they put a match to the oil slick that was coming out of the Penn Central Pipe and burn up the pipe. Somebody else said they should roll a mattress up and jam it up the pipe and flood the rail yard with its own waste. Somebody else suggested that they float a raft of dynamite into the intake of the Indian Point power plant, <laughs> which at that time was killing a million fish a day on its intake screens and taking food off their family tables. And a guy stood up whose name was Bob Boyle, and he was a famous fly fisherman. He was one of the gurus of dry fly tying in this country, but he was also a spin fisherman, an angler, and a, what they call meat fisherman. He'd written a half a dozen books on angling, and he was the outdoor editor for Sports Illustrated magazine. And he, in fact, I think he's still there today. He's been there for 68 years. And two years before, he'd written an article about angling in the Hudson for Sports Illustrated. When he was researching the article, Oil discovered this ancient environmental statute called the 1888 Rivers and Harbors Act, and that statute said that it was illegal to pollute any waterway in the United States. You had to pay a big penalty if you got caught, but also there was a bounty provision that said that anybody who turned in the polluter got to keep half the fine. So he had sent a copy of this law over to the libel lawyers at Time Inc., which owns Sports Illustrated, and he said, is this still good law? And they sent him a memo back saying, it's never been enforced, the bounty provision has never been enforced in 80 years, but it's still on the book, it's still good law. And that evening, when all these men and women were talking about violence, he stood up in front of them with a copy of the law and the memo from the attorneys, and he said, we shouldn't be talking about breaking the law, we should be talking about enforcing it. And they resolved that evening that they were going to start a group that was then called the Hudson River Fishermen's Association, later became Riverkeeper, and they were going to go out and track down and prosecute every polluter on the Hudson. 18 months later, they collected the first bounty in United States history under this 19th century statute. They shut down the Penn Central Pipe for good. They got to keep $2,000, which was a huge amount of money in Crotonville, New York in 1968. There were two weeks of wild celebration in the town. <laughs> and they spent what was left over going after Seba Geigy, Tuck Tape, Standard Brand, American Cyanamid, the biggest corporations in America, and winning their cases. In 1973, they collected the highest bounty, the highest penalty in United States history against a corporate polluter. They got $200,000 from Anaconda Wire and Cable for dumping toxics at Hastings, New York, into the river. They used that money to construct a boat, which they called the River Keeper, which today patrols the river, tracking down polluters. And they used, in 1983, they used bounty money to hire their first full-time River Keeper, a former commercial fisherman named John Cronin. And he hired me a year, again, using bounty money, a year later. And I had always wanted to, I always knew I was going to be an environmental advocate from when I was a little, little boy. In fact, when I was eight years old, I wrote an art, I, a letter to my uncle, President Kennedy, and told him I wanted to have a meeting with him about pollution. <laughs> and he brought me to the White House and sat me in the Oval Office, and I told him I was writing a book on pollution. I brought him a salamander that had actually died, caught the night before, and then it had died in chlorinated water. <laughs> so we spent a lot of the meeting talking about the health of the salamander, and I was saying, <laughs> he's just sleeping. And he was saying, no, he, he said, he, no, he doesn't look well to me. He was poking him. <laughs> we, afterwards, we went and released him in the Rose Garden Fountain, and, um, but he set me up with meetings with, uh, with, um, with Stuart Udall, who was the Secretary of Interior and was probably the greatest Secretary of Interior in American history, um, and, uh, and with Rachel Carson. At that point, he was in, in, uh, 
in a battle to protect Rachel Carson from his own Department of Agriculture and this huge assault that it, um, you know, of the uh, food industry and Monsanto and uh, DDT manufacturers and the uh, uh, Farm Bureau and Time Magazine and Newsweek and, and, uh, and Life and Sports Illustrated, which are all attacking her and trying to, to destroy her. Um, and he appointed a commission that, that vindicated her on every significant issue in that book, and uh, which was Silent Spring, which she published in 1961. So, and I got to tape record them and on these big reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders for this book that I never actually got around to writing until <laughs> I was 29 years old. Um, but, uh, I, so I knew that I wanted to do this. I went, when I, I started working for the Riverkeeper, I was an attorney, I'd worked for the uh, um, attorney for the Manhattan DA, but I, um, I had never done environmental law, and I knew very little about it. I went back to night school at Pace Law School, which is near here, which specialized in environmental law. I got a master's degree so that I could be a better advocate for my client, and then I started a litigation clinic, which I now teach with two other professors, and we have 10 students who, by a court order, can practice law under our supervision as if they were attorneys. We give them each four polluters to sue at the beginning of the semester. They file complaints, they do discovery, they do depositions. <laughs> They don't win the case, they don't pass the course. <laughs> and we've, we brought over, we brought over 450 successful legal actions against Hudson River polluters since we started the clinic. We forced polluters on the river to spend more than $5 billion now remediating the river. And as a result of our work in Scenic Hudson and Clearwater um, and these other little environmental groups, the Hudson today is an international model for ecosystem protection. This is a river that was a national joke in the 1960s. You remember Johnny Carson joking about it on TV. It caught fire. It turned different colors depending on what color they were painting the trucks at the GM plant in Terrytown. It was dead for 20 mile stretches, of oxygen dead, north of New York City, south of Albany. Um, today, it's the richest waterway in the North Atlantic. It produces more pounds of fish per acre, more biomass per gallon than any other water in the Atlantic, any other river going into the Atlantic Ocean. I'll throw in the Mediterranean, the, the Aegean, the Adriatic, the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, the Marmara, the Dardanelles, the Bosphorus, all the rivers going to all those waterways. There's only one left that is still has strong spawning stocks of all of its historical species of migratory fish, and that's the Hudson. It's Noah's Ark, it's a species warehouse, it's the last refuge for many of these animals that are going extinct elsewhere. And the miraculous resurrection of the Hudson has inspired the creation of river keepers and sound keepers and bay keepers all across uh, North America and now all across the world. We have Yesterday, we approved uh, four new keepers in Bangladesh, India, Russia, and I think one in Idaho, and we have now about 250 of them. Each one has to have a patrol boat. They have to have a full-time paid water keeper, and they have to enforce the law against polluters who are breaking the law and stealing from the public, stealing the public trust. So we have them on virtually almost all the major riverways from, from on the west coast, from the Prince William Sound, Alaska, the Fraser River in BC, Puget Sound, the Tualatin and the Willamette, the Columbia, San Francisco Bay, Santa Monica Bay, the Orange County Coast, uh, Ventura County Coast, all the way down to Laguna San Ignacio in Mexico. I think we have about 35 river keepers in Latin America. We have uh, uh, dozens in Russia and eight in India, China. I think 15 in Australia, we're the fastest growing water protection group in the world and, um, and the largest now that does water protection and we're, we're growing now exponentially. But one of the things that I've learned from you know, this community is um, the people who started this movement were, um, were capitalists, they were small fishermen. They believed in our country, they believed in its values, and they understood, and they saw the General Electric Company go into, into the Governor Rockefeller's office and then Governor Kerry's office and, and threaten the governors that they would withdraw 60,000 of their um, workers from New York State if, if those governors didn't allow them to dump toxic PCBs in the river. And so, today, my clients are out of work, a thousand commercial fishermen on the Hudson have lost their job, not because they had a failing business model, but because somebody had more political clout than they did. And they were able to twist and distort and subvert the political process in our country in order to force the public
to shoulder the costs of them bringing their product to market. And, you know, 10 years later, GE left New York State and shut down its factories, left with its pockets stuffed with cash, and left behind a $4.6 billion cleanup bill that nobody in this state can afford. So, and that, that's the legacy of pollution, you know. Um, and and the, 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 the lesson, one of the lessons that I've learned is that good, you know, you hear this mantra on Capitol Hill, on the big polluters and their indentured servants in our political process and their toadies on Fox News and talk uh, radio, that we have to choose between economic prosperity on the one hand and environmental protection on the other. That is a false choice. In 100% of the situations, good environmental policy is identical to good economic policy. If, if we want to measure the economy, and this is how we ought to be measuring it, based upon how it produces jobs and the dignity of jobs over the generation, over the long term, and how it preserves the value of the assets of our community. If, on the other hand, we want to do what the big shots, you know, what the Koch brothers, et cetera, are urging us to do, which is to treat the planet as if it were a business in liquidation, convert our natural resources to cash as quickly as possible, have a few years of pollution-based prosperity, we can generate an instantaneous cash flow, and we can make a few people billionaires by impoverishing the rest of us. But our children are going to pay for our joyride and they're gonna pay for it with denuded landscapes and poor health and huge cleanup costs that are gonna amplify over time and that they will never be able to pay. Environmental injury is deficit spending. It's a way of loading the cost of our generation's prosperity onto the backs of our children. And one of the things I've done over the past 30 years as an environmental advocate is to constantly go around and confront this argument that an investment in our environment is a diminishment of our nation's wealth. It doesn't diminish our wealth. It's an investment in infrastructure. The same as investing in telecommunications and road construction. It's an investment we have to make if we want to uh, ensure ourselves and our children a, a, a vital and robust economy and that they're going to have the same opportunities for dignity and enrichment and good health and prosperity as our parents gave us. Thank you very much. <laughs>